Okay, good evening everybody. Hope you're having a super Saturday. Thanks for joining me. Who have we got in the chat so far? We've got uh, Captain Crash. Excuse me, but are you a real pilot? Uh, Captain Crash, at the moment my job involves making sure this sofa doesn't blow away in a strong breeze. That's uh, that's pretty much what I do. Thanks for joining the uh, stream anyway. Pilsnerish, good to see you. Got the banner hammer ready, I see. Jet Jazz Junkie, thanks for, thanks for coming back to the stream. Thanks for uh, having a look at the 146 with us this evening. Uh, Pilsner, obviously, thanks for uh, thanks for looking after the uh, spammers and the like in the chat. Miles Mace, thanks very much for joining again. Good to see you. And uh, Rusty, getting through the uh, manual for the F-18. Uh, I should imagine it's a fairly complicated machine, the uh, F-18. The um, Elocutioner, good, e uh, good morning, good evening. How are things? And uh, Totorico, good to see you again. Hope you're not... Uh, spending all day every day working on the challenger a few hours off doesn't hurt and winston congratulations on the skills test and uh, thanks for having a look at the 146 with us this evening can everybody hear me okay first and foremost it, it looks okay on the volume uh here but uh, just let me know totally you also sleep from time to time well, i didn't say you could sleep i said you could have a couple of hours off there's a subtle distinction Anyway, this is the uh, 146 from Just Flight, and uh, as we're starting the stream, I mean, the first important thing you need to understand is that I got this product by participating in the beta program. So I haven't bought this as a commercial customer. Now, that said, um, it's not a promotional copy. It's, um, it's an aircraft that I've spent uh, 30 or 40 hours flying and testing and trying to, trying to make it just a little bit better to work in the X-Plane. Thanks to the audio reports, uh, folks. Much appreciated. So I emailed Just Flight and said, look, I, I really love the 146. As an aircraft, I really enjoy uh, being a passenger on it. I thought it's a fantastically innovative machine. It's, it's slightly weird. It's quite quirky looking, but I really, I really liked it. So having uh, the prospect of uh, one being built for X-Plane was something that I really wanted to get involved in and see if there's anything they could do to make it just that little bit better. Um, having a look around the outside, I mean, it, it looks exactly like a 146. It looks like a, the 146 that I remember uh, being a passenger on. The 146 was supposed to be the aircraft I took my first ever passenger flight on, um, but on the day it ended up going tech and it was a, a British Aerospace ATP instead, which, uh, you know, less fun, but still interesting. From the, the I mean, the modeling on it, I quite like the look of it. I'm, I don't have an eye for modelling detail, but it, it looks like a 146. I think what's important to point out is as we look at the aircraft uh, this evening, and to be honest, if you're looking at any of the videos on the YouTube channel or on the Twitch channel, it's important to understand that I'm not trying to sell you the aircraft. So what I want to do is to show you the aircraft, show you the features it has, show you what it does. And if you're thinking about buying it, then um, you know, you can use the video as a as a method of helping you make up your mind whether or not it's, it's right for you. Um, and on the YouTube channel, if you do own the aircraft, the intention is there to, you know, to, to help you get the best out of it. It's got these lovely um, air brakes at the back, which is quite interesting. There's some bits of it that aren't quite as detailed as they could be, for example, the, the back of the engines. But for the most part, the you know, on the outside, it looks it looks reasonable enough to me. Uh, the Matium, thanks very much for joining the chat. I don't know if I acknowledged you before. Good to see you again. And uh, Toto, it was your first flight on a on a 146. Yeah, they they were very common. It's one of the few aircraft that I can think of that uh, went into service and out of service more or less, or out of out of major service within my lifespan. You know, the the 146 survives as a freighter and uh, in very limited passenger services now. But uh, you know, it was. Only really the early 80s the thing came to life. So on the inside, it's it's a slightly different story. For me, um, I'm not a big fan of the texturing in the flight deck. I'm not a fan of the dirty texturing, not because, you know, they, they wouldn't have been dirty in real life, but just the fact that, you know, look at the outside of this aircraft. This aircraft is factory fresh. There's no, there's no soot on the pylons. There's no dirt on the gear. It is fresh out the paint shop as if it was... Uh, leaving Hatfield in 1983, but on the inside it looks like it's lived a 40-year life. So that's the that's the thing for me, that I just don't find the texturing 
um, in sync with the external presentation of the aircraft. If you're going to show wear on one side of it, then show wear on the outside as well. But that's really just my opinion. So let's get it fired up. We're going to fly from Gatwick here down to Bern Airport in Switzerland. That was actually the first commercial service of the 146. Danair uh, operated um, not this aircraft, this is uh, serial number five, but they actually operated serial number six uh, on the first flight. Maybe this one was still in the test program with um, with British uh, Aerospace when Danair put it into service. This is the default livery, uh, Jet Jazz Junkie. Um, one of the users in the Hotstart Discord, uh, Oshin, very kindly did a, another livery with the correct registration, but it didn't quite work out for, for reasons. Um, but you know, it's the exact same livery, just the registration is different. One of the good points about this aircraft is it's got lots of buttons to push. It's a fairly uh, interesting aircraft in its own right. Uh, the systems on the 146 are, are fascinating. Before we start it up, you can see here that we've got um, up here on the hydraulics, we've got hydraulic pumps on engines number two and engine three. And we've got generators on engine one and engine four. So unlike an aircraft like the 747, uh, the 747 has got four generators and uh, let me think, nine or sometimes ten hydraulic pumps, depending on how it's set up. This aircraft's got the uh, two engine driven pumps and the two uh, generators. So though it's four engine, it doesn't have anything like the same uh, the same uh, reliability features, if you like, as the 747. But it's got some interesting things like the uh, PTU and the standby generator, which is a hydraulically driven generator. So let's fire it up. Do we have ground power most importantly? Let's have a look on here. Yes, I should have ground power available. So I'll put the, well, let's just check first of all. We'll make sure that the uh, hydraulics are selected off. That's fine. It's really the electric pumps we're interested in. Before we fire it up, we'll make sure that the strobe lights, the headlights, uh, the landing lights are off. Make sure the gears down, the spoilers and the flaps are in the correct position. Make sure the weather radar is selected off and the transponder selected off. And then we'll bring it to life. One of the things to be aware of with this aircraft, let me find something that's inconsequential at the moment, like the screen heat. If I use my mouse wheel, you see the screen heat responds to the mouse wheel as well as the clicks. So you've got to be careful when you're zooming around on this aircraft because there's so many buttons up here, so many switches, that you can accidentally uh, click some of the switches. Let's put the battery on. And you should hear a little bell from the aircraft. Uh, just let me know if you can't hear the, the sim sounds. I'll adjust them accordingly for you. So we've got a little bit of battery drain now. Having done that, we can bring the external power on. So just check the voltage and the frequency on the external AC. And uh, we should be able to put it on bus. And then we flick the bus ties. We should have power available. Thanks, Toto. Excellent. So external power is applied. We'll just come up here and we'll walk through the aircraft setting it up. I'm going to put the cabin emergency lights to arm. Uh, I'll put the logo lights on just because. Nav lights can go on. Flight deck fan. Should get a bit more noise from the aircraft now. And cabin fans. There was a moped going by just outside as well. I was wondering if that was the uh, aircraft or the, uh, the outside for a second. We'll set the temperature up just a little bit. Hey air fighter, good to see you. Hope you're having a super Saturday. So lights and notices, air conditioning panel set up here. We'll flick all the switches on for the yaw damper masters, the autopilot masters, avionics A and B. Um, notice the auto spoilers in op. So the 146 didn't have auto spoilers, but the RJ, the later version, did have auto spoilers. We'll put the lift spoilers on. And then we've got to check the hydraulics. So Engine 2 and Engine 3 are engine-driven hydraulic pumps. We've also got a DC pump here that runs off the battery. These are the brake pressure indicators here. You can brake on the uh, yellow system or the green system and you select it down here. But really, we don't need to worry about the DC pump because we're on external AC. So I'm going to put the AC pump to auto. You see the yellow system increases. And then I'll flick it onto on to verify it stays on. And then we'll run the PTU. So not so much a barking dog, but a growling dog on the 146. 
and this is how you pressurise both of the hydraulic systems when you don't have either of the engine driven pumps. So they're both checked out, that's fine. Coming down here, we're going to start the APU in a second, so I'm going to set the left inner fuel pump on for the APU. On this panel here, we'll set the uh, meter switch to APU generator. We've already done the bus tie, so I'll arm the standby inverter and the standby gen. Sounds like a cement mixer, Pilsner. It certainly does. You'll notice as well, these panels, uh, these switches are fairly difficult to see um, which position they're in. One of the very early bits of feedback I gave them was just to put a little bit of um, texture on the, the flat surfaces of the switches here so that when you're sitting in the seat it's a little bit more obvious which position they're in, especially when you get a three position. So having done that, we'll come down here. We can put the galley switch on just now because we're running on external uh, APU. We'll come back to that in a second. There's nothing else really to do on this panel. On this panel, we'll set the pressurization so it's not an automatic pressure controller. Uh, we've got to set it roughly to our cruise altitude, which is, let's say, I don't know, should we go to 29,000 feet? You'll notice that if we were to cruise at 33,000 feet, the cabin would be over 10,000. So not many 146s were uh, approved for RVSM above flight level 280 because it simply wasn't worth it. You basically get flight level 290 and flight level 30 and then beyond that it's a waste of time anyway. So we'll go up to 29 today and we'll pretend that that's not a, a factor for us. Ice protection switches, we'll leave those uh, for the time being and uh, on this panel here, well there's not really much to do. We've got the research fans to go with the packs and the engine air. Okie dokie. On the main panel, oh, let's switch the radio on here and set the DME to on as well. Stop the flashing lights. On the main panel, there's not really much to do. We'll set the weather radar so that when it does fire up, it's looking roughly in the right direction. We'll switch on the comm radios. And we'll come down here. It's got control disconnects in here that we don't need to worry about those. This is the autopilot panel or one of the autopilot panels. So I'll put the yaw damper on. Uh, just lift the armrest, I'll put the brake temperature indicator on and I'll put an appropriate transponder code in, ready to go. Other than that, it's fairly straightforward. It's, it's, not a, it's not a difficult aircraft to get into and that's one of the things that you know people might find quite appealing about this model. I'll also point out that in the pack you get the 200 series, the 300 series and they're just a little bit longer, a little bit heavier. You also get the QT, which is the uh, Quiet Trader, I think they called it. It's a cargo conversion. And the uh, Air Force versions, which have got some of the self-defense equipment fitted as well. Let's fire that APU up. So because it's British and a little bit different, you've got this uh, massive test panel up here. So you can check all the fire bells out. There's the post office bell, Pilsner. Just need to make that a little bit louder in my ears so I can hear it. Uh, we've got the APU fire, APU overspeed. You've got basically all the tests there. Let's fire the APU up. So it's just started off the uh, battery of the external AC. The pump's on, so straightforward. Flick the switch, watch the EGT come up, watch the RPM come up. One of the interesting things about the 146, and a lot of people don't realise this, that the engines are started uh, with a conventional electric starter. Uh, it doesn't need bleed air to start. APUs, uh, they are across a little bit weird like that. So APU power available. The APU gen is saying offline. So we'll flick it from the off reset switch to the offline position. It still says offline, but now we can measure the voltage. So the generator is connected to the drive now, but it's not connected to the aircraft. The voltage and the frequency is good. We'll flick the APU on and we can disconnect external AC. I'll do that up here. And before I forget, we'll close the doors and the stairs as well. We should be able to do that externally. Let me see if I can get a view of that. So there were some frame rate issues um, when I had a look at this earlier, but that's mostly been resolved now. It's, it's seeming a lot better. Let's flick out the switch panel here, stairs. Do you know what? The stairs are hydraulic on this aircraft, aren't they? Let's run this one. I can't remember 
storage system we're on. We don't need the PTU for the stairs. There we go. And let me just move the camera so we can have a look at the door animation. There it goes. So it's a lot smoother than it was on the, the first release. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a separate starter generator, Captain Crash. It does seem like a weird arrangement for sure. Right, I'll put that pump back. Okay, so the APU is on bus. We've got rid of the external. I'm going to put the APU air on. Then we'll put the packs on. And we'll put the cabin air recirculation on as well. So that should be all the sound from the aircraft now. Just make sure it's not overly loud in the sim. It does tend to flash these lights for pretty much everything you do. Uh, it would be enormously frustrating if the real thing did that. I think there's maybe a timeout on it, it needs to consider. The APU is an industrial hairdryer. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Um, I've already loaded the fuel and the passengers. So 85 passengers, uh, around about 800 kilos of, uh, fuel, of, uh, of freight or baggage. And five and a half, six tons of fuel should be enough. You've got three main tanks, you've got the uh, wing tanks, you've got the center tank, and there's also some feed tanks uh, that feed the engines out in the outer wing tips as well. It's, it's a fairly unusual arrangement. Hey Bottle Rocketeer, thanks for joining the chat. Hope you're having a good evening. Right, let's load the route. So one of the things that is not ideal in this aircraft is the inclusion of the default FMS. I don't really like the default FMS, if I'm being honest. Um, simply because it it doesn't really do things properly in a lot of cases. It gets lost quite easily. And uh, it's just, it's not ideal. However, we'll do the best we can. So Gatwick to Bern was the very first commercial service operated by 146, as I said. So we'll use the ceremonial flight number of Danair 146, just for the sake of something a bit interesting. Of course, I'm not doing it VOR, we'll keep it straightforward today, so I will use the FMS for that. We'll fly the Bognut 1 X-ray departure, execute that, have a look on the legs, it goes ahead on uh, course 257. So let's set course 257 on the uh, heading pointer, uh, roughly there. It goes above 2,500 feet, above 4,000 feet, stop altitude 5,000 feet, and it's 220 knots, so I'll set 5,000 feet. It's got this windy handle as well here, um, the scroll wheel, I think I demonstrated a few days ago, the scroll wheel gets interrupted as the, as the crank handle comes in the, into the, uh, the cursor, if you like. But one of the things you can do is just click and hold and it will scroll with the left mouse button. So if that's annoying you, click and hold does it as well. Just a bit frustrating. Anyway, 5,000 feet and uh, track 257. Excellent. At that point, I'll bring the flight directors on as well. And the autopilot control panel's down here. We've got a pitch up and a pitch down command. I've got keystrokes for those because that's pretty useful. It doesn't have any speed reference system. So all I'm going to do is put it into LNAV. Uh, actually, let me switch to NAV mode rather than forelock mode. There's NAV mode. I'll put it into LNAV. Arm for out capture at 5,000 feet, and then I'll just use that pitch wheel, and I'm going to set the pitch target to around about uh, five degrees. Text latte, hey, thanks for joining the chat. Um, yeah, I I participated in the beta program for this aircraft, so I haven't bought it as a commercial customer. Um, I thought I'd just I'd show you the aircraft, and you can make your own decisions on whether or not you you like it. So five degrees, that's going to be the acceleration pitch altitude. Let's load the rest of the flight plan. So it can probably do stuff like load it from the uh, FMS file, but there's only a few waypoints. And to be honest, you get a feel for how easy the FMS is to use by, by loading things manually. So there's probably five or six waypoints in here. It's the Upper Lima 612 to Resme. Uh, I don't know if this does automatic uh, selection. I don't know, Upper November 491. Is there a way to make this work with the uh, keyboard. How did they use this before? Can you tell me if it works with the, the keyboard? Because I genuinely don't know. Melco. 
Uh, we're going upper mic 606. Upper mic 606 goes to Manhag. Click on scratch pad. Manhag. Oh, there we go. That's better. Thanks, uh, air fighter. Much appreciated. Uh, Manhag. Where are we going after that? It's upper mic uh, 139. And that is to uh, Luxoy. And then it's the uh, Upper Lima 613. And that goes to uh, Hochfeld. Airfighter has saved you all from watching a middle-aged person stab at a keyboard for 47 minutes. Romeo 73, and that is to uh, Willa. Done. Execute. Done. Let's load the arrival as well. Um, ILS to 1.4. It's a 4 degree approach, so it's a steep approach. And let me just remember my training on the, on the uh, default FMS. I'll cancel that. I'll select the star first, and then I'll select the approach, and then I'll select the transition. That should do it. We'll step through. Yeah, I didn't know it was an option either, Bottle Rocketeer, so I've learned something today. Um, Bricky, I'm just going to link those two together, and we'll talk about the rest of that as we go. So that's the flight plan in. The system is set up for the departure. The first waypoint is runway 26 left, 257, 257. We're stopping at 5, and we've got uh, the heading pointer set. We've got LNAV mode, and we've got altitude capture. There is no auto thrust on the 146. The RJ, the later version of the same aircraft, does have auto thrust, and it's got a proper MCP panel up here rather than this thing. Um, is it on hover right now? Did I leave it on hover? No, I don't think so. Oh, I see. Sorry, disregard. Um, it doesn't have auto thrust, but it does have the thrust modulation system down here. Now, the way this is implemented isn't quite right at the moment, but it does something. So we'll turn it on and we'll set it to uh, takeoff mode. And basically what the TMS system does is it adjusts the fueling. So it doesn't move the levers in the real thing, but it just increases or decreases the fuel in the uh, going to the engines. This blue arrow here is saying with the throttles where they are, it can't make takeoff thrust, so I'd need to move the throttles forward. Okay, but the rating it's aiming for is 93.7. So I'm going to set that on here. Now, I'm super lazy. I'm only going to set the number one engine because as I said, lazy. Target temperature, that's for the after the acceleration, that's 840. If you remember the TBM, you remember 840 is the limit um, for normal operation on TBM, and 790 is fairly good for a comfortable cruise. Well, it's very similar on the 146. Um, this is Celsius. I can't remember if it's the same. I'm sure it is. Right, we've got the... Uh, FMS set. You've actually got two separate FMSs. They're not a mirror of the same thing, so you can have different fixes displayed if, if that's your thing. We've got the FMS set. We've got the flight director set. They're switched on. We've got the yaw damper. I think we're in a fairly good position to start the engines. If we can work out how to start the engines. Let's get better pushback uh, ready to go as well. See what sort of tug we get today. Ground to cockpit. Please show me where you want to go. Yeah, that Ground to cockpit. Toe is driving up. Big tug, little tug. Sometimes you get the small one, sometimes you get the medium sized one. This is obviously not what Gatwick would have looked like when the um, when Dan Air were here. This is the kind of new terminal area doesn't really look much like uh, what it used to do. Ah, oh, there we go. It's the medium-sized tug. Right, let's get the aircraft ready to go. So I'm going to put the fuel pumps on. Two, three. I'm going to check the brake accumulator. We've still got brake accumulator pressure. That's fine. It's electrically started, so I need to reduce load on the APU generator. So I'll switch the galley off. The engines, we're going to put the engine anti-ice on. That's to minimise okay. the... all doors and hatches are closed. Ready to connect. Thank you. That's to minimise the drag on the uh, engine as you start it up. It basically reduces the, the load on the compressor. You should probably put the seatbelt signs on as well. 
Um, up here we're going to switch off the packs. We'll switch off the APU air. Again, it's electrically started. We'll put the beacon on. Verify the seatbelt signs on. Come down here and we'll check that the transponder is set to transponder mode. Just double check that the doors are closed. Obviously the cabin crew would not uh, get you in this position otherwise. Have we done everything before I do that? We've got those. Oh, there's another switch I forgot. The flight deck emergency lights. My bad. Why do you have two? Cabin emergency lights, flight deck emergency lights. That is all done. That's done. That's done. Yeah, let's go. So, brakes come off. Starting pushback and you may start engines. Excellent. We've got four engines to start, so it's just four, three, two, and one. Stuff is up here. We'll select the switch. I'll set the start master to on. We get start power selected. The anti ice is on, the fuel's on, and the packs and the APU is off. So I'm going to push and hold. Starter operating, the ignition's on. We look down here, it's spinning up. I'll just click this little lever here to unlatch the, the throttle. And then we get to 20% fuel in. I'm going to click these ones here as well, just so I can do the rest from the seat. goes. EGT's, uh, not EGT. Temperature's rolling back, that's fine. Start number three, same thing. Start, ignition, starter operating. N1's increasing. So as I said, it's a fairly straightforward, fairly accessible aircraft uh, to get into jet flying. It doesn't have anything fancy with the flight directors, it doesn't have anything fancy with the with the systems and there's just some buttons to to learn how to use in the correct sequence but I don't think there's many consequences to getting things slightly out of order in this aircraft. Okay second uh, start is good. Let's start number two. Same thing. Generator ignition, uh, sorry, ignition starter operating. Number two is filling up. 20%. Operation complete. Set parking brake. Right, parking brake is set. We check the, Disconnecting toes. the yellow brake indicator because obviously there's nothing feeding the hydraulics at the moment, so that's fine. Final engine, number one, and start. Thanks for the tip on the uh, FMC air fighter. I really need to try out the Avanti. I, I tried it ages ago, and um, on my old computer with my old graphics card, the uh, frame rates were pretty difficult. But to be honest, everything on that computer was fairly difficult, so I need to try it again. I used to love seeing them in Genoa, uh, the Piaggio Avantis. We used to call them piggies. I don't know if that's if that's a fair assessment of the aircraft. They're super looking things. Right. Toes disconnected and bypass pin has been removed. Hand signal on the right. We'll see you next time and have a safe flight. Thank you very much. Right, the engines are running. Let's set the start switch to off. Start master to off. Having done that, let's get the e, uh, the hydraulics running first. So, important that the AC pump will latch. Okay, if the AC pump is triggered, it will stay switched on regardless of whether or not it's set to the auto position or not. So it automatically switches on, but it won't automatically switch off. So we run engine 2 pump, we make sure the hydraulics come up and the low pressure disappears. Then we run engine 3. And then when they're both normal, we put the AC pump to auto and the PTU to on. So those are the primary feeds for the green and the yellow and the backups. Um, sorry, it's yellow and green on this aircraft, isn't it? So you get the yellow and the green. Right, then we put the generators on. So just like the APU, we've got the offline switch. So it comes into the uh, gauges, if you like, and then on. 
and then the same on this one. It's in the green range, and then on. I'll put the galley on. We could select the APU off at this point, but that would generate a cast message or a, a warning message, so I'll leave that selected on just now. I'm finished with the engine anti-ice. Coming up here, we'll put the screen heats, the pito heaters. There's a double click on this one because it's battery powered. I'll put the APU air on. I'll put the packs on, check that we've got the race arc. There's one other oddity on the 146, is that the APU is pressurizing the cabin and air conditioning the cabin. The reason for it is the engines are so small there isn't enough airflow on the ground, even with four of them apparently, to condition or pressurize the cabin effectively. However, I understand that the outflow valve is controlled by the number four bleed or by the engine bleed. So you've got to have the number four engine air on even when you're using the APU to run the packs. Just weird. What's the stuttery animations of the APU? Um, some of the animations are frame rate limited to a boss rocketeer. I don't understand it. Um, I haven't seen that in any other aircraft. It just seems a little bit strange. Uh, have we done everything in the overheads? I think we have. Let's set flaps. Uh, I'll check the trims. Brake fans we don't need to worry about. Get rid of the flashing message. So what have we got here? Parking brake on and air selected on ground. That's because of the number four. There's no warnings. I think we're in good shape. In fact, person's gone. Let's put on the taxi lights. It's these switches here. Down and down. We're clear on the left side. We're clear on the right side. And off we go. There's a config check here, so with the brakes released, no warning, we're in good shape. That's a good explanation, Totrico. I have no idea. Quick brake check, that's fine. And we'll do the flight controls as we're moving. See the roll spoilers just above the, the gear indicators here? Ah, this is the first time I've flown this updated version. They have reduced the ground friction or given it a bit more idle thrust. There's something slightly different. But it's moving a lot better now. Watch me run away. Now notice there's no ground speed showing uh, when I'm on the LNAV mode, the ground speed in the distance. You need to set this to split for some reason to get that to show. Now we can talk about this when we get a little bit, uh, well, when we get airborne. But just one thing I've noticed. So you're going to ask me, without a, a PFD, without a FMS that is speed aware, how are we going to fly the departure? What speeds are we going to use? Well, it's very straightforward. There's a little chart down here. For the weight, we've got the rotation speed and the flat retraction speeds. In this aircraft, you can just click the button, or click the, um, sorry, not here. You can click the card and it will set the speeds for you. Okay. So the internal bug, that's the yellow one, is set to my uh, V2 speed. And that's fine. It also drives this fast slow index here. That's all that yellow thing does. It doesn't let you fly it on this bug. It doesn't let you pitch up or pitch down with this. It just drives this index. You see the speed bug in up. It just means it doesn't do anything other than drive the index there. We're going to rotate that to around about 120. It says 118 on there. 129. And then final takeoff is when we retract the flaps. And on route is our minimum clean speed. All we have to do is we'll put the lights on. Come on, there we go. The strobes, for some reason, they're all the way back here. Everything else is set up there. I think we're good to go. Yeah, that's how it should have been, Toto, but uh, angle of attack in the 1980s. It's, uh, it's just not a thing. I seem to have caught that with the mouse as well. Let's set that back there. So that's one of the things, that everything in the cockpit responds to the mouse wheel. Um, and you just have to be aware when you're scrolling around. 
So Gatwick runway 26 left. We've got the lights on, strobes on. So on the departure, we are simply going to fly up to around about 12 to 15 degrees and I'll pitch to maintain V2 to V2 plus 10. So just hold it momentarily on the brakes here. This is the V2 bug. Flying at V2 would be right on the, the centre here and that's the minimum speed in the event of an engine failure. With both, uh, sorry with both, with all four engines running, V2 to V2 plus 10, so that's the bug just slightly fast is fine. And it'll be about 15 to, um, well, 12 and a half to 15 degrees typically. And when we get to 1000 feet we'll just lower it down to 5 degrees. 5 degrees sounds like a very low pitch but it's got a lot of flap out here so the wing, the actual effective cord line on the wing is much greater than you expect on, on other aircraft. Right, let's go. We've checked the config and I'm simply going to advance the thrust levers until I get it roughly to that 93 point here. Now the TMS should take over and start adjusting the fueling to maintain about 93, but as I said, it was my noisy joystick the axis, it doesn't quite do it. 80 knots cross checked. It's got nice collins. V1, rotate. V2. So pause to climb, gear up. So I'm just pitching to about 15 degrees, I'll just trim ever so slightly. I notice I'm sitting there around about 140 or so, that's fine. It's not getting any slower, not getting any faster. That's all we really need to worry about. And then at 1000 feet I'm going to lower the nose to that pitch index and see my target. I'm just going to ease the power back until that target comes back to 840. I'm going to reach down here and put the autopilot on. I'm going to change over to target mode and I'm going to select vertical speed. Nope, it's not there, it's here. Make sure Archer requires it. The FTO, safe height speed, select flaps up. Flaps up we have. And that's us airborne with pretty much everything needed to happen. It's a 220 knot restriction on the departure. And I'm now in, in vertical speed mode. So that means I can use my little wheel down here to adjust the vertical speed, or I can do it on my uh, keyboard, which is easier for me. Superboy, thanks for joining the chat. I think it flies quite nicely. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy with how the aircraft flies. Um, it, it feels like what I'd imagine a 146 feels like. It's fairly sluggish. But uh, yeah, it's pleasant. Sims a bit loud. Okay, let me turn that down. Oh my goodness, it is loud. Is that any better? There we go. Hopefully that's a bit better. Are we in LNAV? Don't make a liar of me. Yeah, it should be turning. There we go. I was messing with the sound and I let the speed increase. I'll come back to 220 for the turn, it's no big deal. So obviously we've got about a thousand feet to go. My vertical speed is 1500 feet per minute, that's fine. Now, if I wanted to, I could set it to IES mode. And then I can adjust my rate of climb by adjusting the power. The problem with doing that is there's a fair bit of lag in there, so you bring the power off, the nose will come down, and then that will stabilise in a in a weird manner. So you can do it either way. Either way is good. Looks like we might be going into some cloud there. Temperature is below 10, so let's put the engine anti-ice on. 234. At 250 knots is fine. And I'll make a reasonable power reduction and maintain 5,000 feet on the departure. What I can do is I can just dial my uh, speed target round to 250. And that'll keep it uh, the little index here so I can check on that as well. Excellent. Now that we're airborne, we can turn on the rest of the engine air switches. 
we can switch off the APU air, switch off the APU gen, see it bings, it shouldn't really, it shouldn't really worry about that when the uh, other gens are on, and we'll shut the APU down. And uh, there's a warning, but there's no warning showing. So the real thing has like a one or two second delay. It can flash something up on here without these uh, lights flashing, as I understand it. It is a slippery slope to real weather and time, Pilsner. If I did it real time, it would always be dark. Right, let's get up to the cruising altitude then. So you can spin the handle, which is satisfying. You can click and hold on the left mouse button, or you can use the wheel. Either way works, really. 2.9, and all I'm going to do for the climb is stick it into IS mode, push the power levers forward until the target comes up. And remember, having changed your vertical mode, you have to arm altitude capture. It doesn't automatically capture the altitude, which can be a bit of a faff. So I'm just going to set about 840. Now, TMS has got a sync function as well that will synchronise the uh, either the N1 or the N2. I think it only does it with the N2 in this model. And there we are, climbing away. I can use the nose up and nose down. See, my, my nose up still works. That's basically in... Uh, it knocks it into pitch mode, and then you can reset the aircraft where you want it to be. We don't climb any faster than 250 knots in the 146 because it's just not really that... It, it doesn't do well at high speed. Will the TMS assist with MCT power? It should do. So at the moment it's set to target. You can do MCT. That It seems to get it confused. Um, the TMS doesn't... It still has some kinks in it to what to... If I put it to MCT, uh, it should adjust to whatever the current target is, or whatever the current max is, and then back to target, you get 840. Uh, or whatever you've got set on here, is the theory. But it gets confused, as I said. There we go. It's given up. So it'd be nice to have proper auto thrust, but... There. Flight level 100. Let's put those lights off. I'll put the fasten seat belts off. The PTU, now the PTU is really there for the flaps at low level. The flaps are the biggest um, hydraulic consumer apart from the gear. So now that we don't have to worry about flaps and gear, we can have the PTU off. And because it's daylight, I'll switch the logo light off as well. And there's that flashing caution before, something we don't have. Green thing here says engine anti-ice is on. We still need it? Yeah, probably need it for a little bit. And the cabin's pressurising. Uh, yep, IES just locks where it is when it's engaged, uh, Pilsner-ish, so that we've got IES hold at the moment. If I nudge this, IES goes off and it just reverts to pitch hold. So I can now pitch it using the up and down buttons. But whenever I select IES hold here, it just, it just locks onto wherever it is. I think that's fairly realistic. Um, I know the fly JSIM does it a different way, but I, I'm not 100% sure if that's, strictly speaking, correct. Um, for the simple reason that for the autopilot to hold indicated airspeed, the only input it needs is to sense the pito. It only needs to sen sense pito static pressure. Pito and static pressure, just like the airspeed indicator. But for it to follow the bug, it has to have some kind of... Uh, electronic or electrical hookup to the airspeed indicator and be able to sense difference. So it either needs the airspeed indicator to encode the airspeed and encode the target speed, or it needs that to be presented as a, as a PITO equivalent into the autopilot. So having the autopilot follow the bug using 1960s and 70s technology, which is really what this aircraft is, can be fairly, fairly difficult. So do a flyby. Again, for my personal taste, the heat haze is, is a little bit overdone, I think. But that's just me.
the poor little Aussie 80 has enough to do. Oh, sorry, I missed the question um, for FSX videos. Thanks for the chat, and uh, sorry I missed you when you checked in there. Um, does the environment and realism that the aircraft present feel cheap in any way or incomplete? That's a good question. Um, does it feel incomplete? It's difficult for me to answer that. Um, let me answer that in a roundabout way. The aircraft is provided with a fair amount of documentation. It's got a, a tutorial documented in the uh, in the manual that's provided with it. If you fly the aircraft according to that documentation, it does exactly what it's supposed to do there, and it feels like you're doing lots of airline pilot sort of things. If you try and fly it uh, according to some differences you can find in the real world notes for the aircraft, then there's some bits missing. Okay. So it's not a fully featured training level simulation of a 146. The environment in the in the cockpit it's difficult. You can kind of kind of get used to it. Um, I don't think it's the very best out there with X plane. The X plane can do a lot better than, than this kind of modelling. But it's okay, you know, you don't have much in the way of choices for a 146 aircraft in X-Plane. And this, this gives you the 146 experience. Um, you know, you can do 146 kind of flying with it. Let me just double check that we are not going to bust any limits there. I just switched the anti-ice off and I was very remiss. I have taken off without putting the weather radar on. But, you know, no weather. I'll show you the cabin. So you got all three variants in this aircraft. You get the, in fact, you get more than three variants. You get the uh, freighters as well. I think it's in the cabin. If I was looking at this and compare it with other aircraft that are available, I'd say the cabin is where it shows its um, it, its differences. It, it's not the most detailed virtual cabin. Like on the Fly JSM, you can operate the overheads. On this aircraft, you can't operate the overheads. The, the modelling, it's very low polygon in here. Now the result is you get reasonable frame rates with it. But, I, to be honest, I think you could do a better interior with this aircraft. Uh, and not really suffer from the frame rates. I hope that makes sense. So when I, when I got this aircraft and I started uh, testing it, I was looking at things like the VOR navigation and, and how it felt to fly and the systems um, and it it's got different features from a from a 737 and from an A320 it's a different airline experience one of the things that you can't avoid on the 146 is it's very 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 slow it doesn't go anywhere quickly at all at flight level 26 27 or even 29 we're going to be doing 400 knots the fuel burn on it can be crazy high as well that's what 700 1400, 2.8 tons an hour in climb at uh, flight level 200. It's a thirsty thing. For 85 seats, it burns about the same amount of gas as an A319 with 150 odd. Maybe a touch less. Yeah, as I said, if you if you want the 146 and X plane, there's this or there's the Avro Liner project. Um, I enjoy flying this. I, I've never tried the Avro liner. So what are we doing? We're doing 250 knots still. Um, once we get up to around about 0 0.65, I'll transition over to Mach for the final part of the climb. So as I said, this is the first time I've flown this particular version of the aircraft. And did that get confused? It did. It um, it did seem to be doing a better job on the TMS than the previous one, so that's a good thing. We are. There's that uh, aircraft carrier again. So this is the departure uh, of Gatwick out towards uh, the waypoint Bogna, heading across to France, and then uh, down over towards Baal, and then Bern.
Is there anything specific MD would like to see about the aircraft while we're while we're climbing here? Anything on the systems you, you want to have a look at? Melvin Realoy, thanks for joining the chat. Hope you're having a good evening. <laughs> yeah, flight level 250 by press week. It's a, it's an interesting aircraft. It's one of the few British aircraft that actually does hot and high performance really quite well. I mean, it's a very successful product in its day. Um, in the 80s, the early 80s, that it was really designed in the 70s. And there's this feeling that city centre airports were going to be a real thing, you know. Uh, uh, short, steep approaches into city centre airports were going to be the next big thing for airline travel. You know, people had done jumbo jets from 4,000 metre runways out of town, but, you know, people wanted to get around Europe into city centres in less the time than it took to fly to the major international hubs. And the 146 was designed with that in mind. Uh, the reason it's got four engines is because of the engine out climb gradient. It doesn't lose a lot of performance when it loses one of its engines, so it can climb... Um, it, it doesn't have to be massively overpowered to operate from tight, uh, constrained airfields. So although it's very underperforming up at these altitudes, at low level you don't lose much performance if you lose one of the engines. It's fairly good for that. But the flip side is those those city centre airports, with a few notable exceptions, they just didn't happen. You know, the the problem is that city centre air quality uh, is something that in the late 70s, early 80s became a real big concern and uh, it, it just didn't really happen. But these things operated into London City for years. They operated commercial services into Aspen as well. Very popular in Australia. Um, not so many of them in North America, but you know a few notable ones like Aspen as I said. Interesting aircraft. So they're apparently working on a custom FMS for it, but I've got no information or any any insight at all into into which FMS or whether it's something completely new that's going to go in here. Yeah, the regional twins happen. So things like the well, the CRJ, a CRJ can't do what a 146 does, but the Embraer's um, the Embraer uh, 175 or 195 can certainly do what this does. That's you know they were built with this as its target. You just can't get away from the fact you've got four engines and it's thirsty to maintain. It, it's thirsty and it's um, extra engines to worry about. They're not too bad. The 300 series carried a lot more passengers, so it brought the cost per, ma per passenger mile down a little bit. But it does look like a little C-17. You can see it from here. If it had some strikes on the engines, it would just make that a bit quieter. If it had some strikes on the engines, it would look like a C-17 to a certain extent. Right, let's do the rest of the climb in Mach. So I've changed vertical modes, verify that we are still um, altitude uh, acquire. Oh, we go. Oh, I haven't aligned my heading bug. Look at that. Spin that round. I got the um, CRJ200 for X plane a few years ago, Captain Crash, and I couldn't believe how much runway that aircraft needed to get airborne. And then I was like, 26, 27,000 feet thinking. I'm sure they said this was a 35, 40,000 feet aircraft and it's struggling at 25. But apparently that's the real thing. Has MD in the chat got the, got the 146 yet? MD thinking about it. Still has this dancing trim. I wish it didn't do that. At least it doesn't click all the time now. 
Now, having said that, it's going to click all the time now. Are we there yet? 27,000 feet. This is the problem with the airliner flying that we're not even really going that far. If I bring it up on the fixed page here, I'll say that we are going to go to uh, LSZB. Put that on here. 50 minutes, 320 miles. And so, as I said, you've got two separate FMSs, so you can have different fixes if you want. I don't know how the separate flight plans work on these. But it's nice that they're not just a mirror image. Uh, for FSX videos, it has been updated. Uh, there's been one or two updates a day since it launched, I think. This is 1.0.4. Um, nothing revolutionary at the moment. Um, when it launched, it had some optimizations put in there for the frame rates um, that were causing slightly stuttery animations if you didn't have a... You know, I was frame rate, frame rate limited to 30 frames a second using B-Sync, and it was causing my animations to stutter quite a bit. Well, it doesn't do that anymore. Um, it's had some... Uh, what else was done? The the tumblers on the, you know, the, the numbers here were adjusted so they operate a bit smoother. Um, and there's stuff like the uh, iPad thing here, the tablet device, it's got the can turn the windscreen reflections on and off, the instrument reflections on and off in there. Um, that's that's about it so far. That's 1,000 feet to go. Now obviously I'm climbing in Mach mode, but if I make a slight power reduction, see that it's about 800 just now, if I bring it back to around about eight, uh, 805, you'll see that what happens is the rate of climb starts to reduce. So I see a lot of sim pilots uh, asking about, does an aircraft have auto thrust? And when it doesn't have auto thrust, they say, well, I can't fly without auto thrust, or I, I need auto thrust to live, that sort of thing. I get it. I mean, goodness, I would want to do four sectors every day without auto thrust. That would be hard work. But you get used to it. Once you realize that when you're in Mach or IAS hold mode, the power is actually controlling your rate of climb and not your speed, once that clicks, it all becomes quite straightforward. So look, if I just bring that power back ever so slightly until it gets down to about two or three hundred feet a minute, when it levels off, it isn't really going to accelerate. You know, because I've only got enough excess thrust for, at the moment, 400 feet a minute. So you can kind of finesse the rate of climb as you get close, and that way you don't have a huge power reduction when you get to the, the altitude. A lot more passenger friendly that way. And you can do the same on descent. So rather than stick it into vertical speed mode and then wind the nose down to 2,000 feet a minute, um, you simply click it into IES hold mode and then gradually bring the power back and the aircraft will lower the nose and, and follow down. Check the pressurization as we level off. Yeah, it's there. That's good. I hear the, the trim chirping away there. There we go. And I'll just make a slight power reduction there. And I'm looking for about 0.6566, uh, even 6.7. Let's set 6.6 six in a bit. And then I've just got the indication up here whether or not we're going too fast or too slow. So that's exactly how we do it in the Airbus uh, FSX videos. If we were able to dispatch an Airbus without auto thrust, because it's, it's just an airplane. Um, but what we do is use the open modes, so open climb, open descent. And when it's an open climb, all you do is move the power uh, down a little bit, and that reduces your rate of climb. Toto, so, so thanks very much for joining the stream. Um, good luck with the rest of the coding, and uh, the future of flight simulation is counting on you, my friend. <laughs> Have fun. And the other thing, uh, FSX videos, on the same subject, is if you have uh, an engine failure in the cruise, for example, you would use open descent or uh, flight level change uh, if you have that in a Boeing. That's to get the aircraft descending. But then you just push the power lever and the remaining engines forward to MCT. So the aircraft's giving you the most amount of power it's got, and you're open descending to whatever altitude you can get, really. 
and then the aircraft just drifts down. So it all becomes straightforward. Once you understand that the excess thrust you have, the excess power, is what gives you rate of climb, it kind of works out. I'm going to put that into sync mode now. That should synchronise at the moment the N2 on here, just reduce the cabin noise. And that's the theory anyway. Anything we need to do on the overhead that I haven't already done or have misselected? No. 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 No warnings. That's always a good sign. Where are we? Ruon. So what's everybody else been up to today? Captain Crash, I know you've been doing some coding work again. Having some fun with some radials, I hope. Why can I not uh, get that just into trim? It's going to give it a touch more power, see if that sorts its life out. Maybe actually a little bit less. There we go. So, before I start waffling on about things that don't really matter, we need to consider the descent, because now that we're up here, we've got to get back down again. Hey? Let's have a look at Avatab. Uh, we're going to... not there. We're going to LSB. And from start to finish, we are going to fly the uh, arrival, the uh, Willisau arrival. It's going to take us down to Willisau, across and into Berkey. That was the name I was looking for. Let's put that on here. Berkey as a second fix, just to be aware of. Berkey. And uh, down there, let's have a look at the legs. So we've got Will, we've got Pilar above 6,000, we've got Copy above 6,000, we've got Lardo above 4,000, speed 210, we've got ZB696, speed 210, and we've got Berkey uh, above 4,000, speed 210, that all checks out. And then on the approach, we are looking at, there's there, ILS14. Berkey, we're going to intercept at 6.3, which is 4,000 feet. There's the fix there. And down to the runway, 1,700. Yeah, 50 feet above, that's fine. Mist approach goes out, turns left, intercept 2 to 2 radial out towards Ramok. And then what do we do at Ramok? Back to Berkey. Yeah, it looks like it'll work. We'll have a look at the high profile in just a second. Captain Crash, uh, sorry, uh, Pro FSX videos, you took the IXCG 737 out earlier. You're going to go to your RC flying field for some fresh air. That sounds nice. What sort of aircraft are you flying? Is it, uh, is it internal combustion? Is it electric? Ducted fan? That sort of thing. Captain Crash, you've been flying the A2A. Yeah, I saw that. It's nice to get back into an older aircraft. It struggles with the FPS. That's all that single thread. FSX just dates from that time when single thread performance is what the world uh, was interested in. But it's, it's not going that way anymore. Jet Jazz Junkie's been flying the Flight Factory A320. It's always nice to see the other aircraft get a little bit of attention as well. I do find the flight deck on the Flight Factor to be better than the TOLIS. Um, it, it feels more like an Airbus. Um, the TOLIS the Tolis is good, it flies nicely, it's good on frames. Um, the automation's fairly nice, but it really needs a, a better 3D model, to be honest. Ducted fan, nitro and electric, you've got all the toys. That's, that's what I like to hear. I've just brought the power back a little bit because the speed was creeping up there. So I'm going to look for about uh, 6667. Excellent. It's an earlier version of the same 3D cockpit. Oh, I didn't realise that. That would explain some things. So look, this aircraft here, this um, this thing, has VNAV somewhere. You can set the flight, uh, the vertical path angle. I have no idea how that works with this aircraft. Um, if the airfighter is still there, he might be able to tell us how the VNAV descent works. Um, to be honest, I don't tend to use VNAV. 
uh, we'll just have a look at the vertical profile and we'll calculate it back from where we need to be. If we could combine TOLIS and Flight Factor then you'd have a nice aircraft, yeah absolutely, if we could get a nice um, external model it'd fit in. That's one of the things I find quite frustrating about the, the INI model is the 3D modelling on the, ex the external 3D modelling and the, the Flight Deck 3D modelling is very good on the INI, um, but it just doesn't fly that nicely. Yeah, the button animations are a bit of a... not having those is annoying. I, I like to see the buttons push. Right, so let me have a look at this arrival. So the first thing we need to look at is the approach itself. Some interesting things on here. ILS is uncategorized, and we've got a four degree glide path. Okay, so it's a steep approach. If you don't want the uh, GPWS to go off on the steep approach, you come down here and you push the steep approach button. So that's that taken care of. We need to set the aircraft up for the radio aid approach. It's an ILS approach. So course 138. Look, I've got course 138 on the left and the right hand side. Now, if you're using the VOR, there's these little switches here. Switches it from radio navigation, or from RNAV, sorry, to radio navigation. So RNAV is area navigation, that's the FMS, and NAV is the VOR. Uh, it's not very clear, really, is it? But RNAV is what we're on just now. If both of these switches are set to NAV in the split mode, then the left-hand HSI uses this window and this radio, and the right-hand HSI uses this window and this radio. Okay. However, because this was built in the day when VOR to VOR navigation was the way to navigate, it's not really ideal having to say to the FO, you take it for this leg and I'll take it for the next leg and we'll swap it over. And it just doesn't work that way. So you have the ability to say, look, let's both use NAV1, so both HSIs are using this course and this radio, and then we've got the second leg ready to go on NAV2, all tuned up but not displayed anywhere, and then when we get overhead the waypoint, we just flick it over, and we're now using NAV2, and they're both using NAV2. Okay, you can see how it changes the, how it should change the HSI course if we were swip, set to uh, VOR mode. It doesn't it might be a design feature, I really don't know, but it only really works properly in the FMS mode if you set it to split mode. Um, you might expect that, you might expect the left hand FMS only to drive here and the right hand FMS only to drive here. Um, at the moment it's it's an outstanding issue that that, uh, FMS, that HSI isn't being driven, but uh, I'm sure they'll get to that uh, just as soon as they can. Oh, default uh, VNAV has problems. Oh, there's a surprise. Yeah, that's that's annoying. Techslat, thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, it'll be on video on demand uh, just as soon as the stream's finished. You have a good night, and uh, and thanks for coming back to the stream. So if we don't have VNAV, how are we going to build this approach in our mind? We've got to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to do. It's a steep approach. I want to be at 4,000 feet with most of the flaps out. Okay, I want the speed back below 140 knots. All the flaps out, all the gear out, and some of the speed brake at 4,000 feet. Okay, so from that 4,000 feet point into Berkey, we've got two miles. Okay, now two miles, if you're, if you're to fly a three degree profile, a like slightly shallower profile, that would be, I don't know, about 600 feet or so. Thanks for joining uh, Pro FSX video. Much appreciated. Uh, you have a good night. We got a fuel warning as well. I'll cancel that and we'll come back to that because that's another, maybe a little bit of a glitch at the moment. We'll have a look. Right, planning. So, at Berkey, two miles back, I'm going to just say four and a half thousand feet. I want to be at Berkey at four and a half thousand feet. Okay, so I'm still above four thousand feet. So four and a half thousand feet is fine. Now. Three miles back, that would take us to five and a half thousand feet. Another three miles, that would take us to six and a half thousand feet. So still making up with these uh, constraints here. Another three miles, seven and a half thousand feet. You see, it's fairly straightforward. I also need to build in some time to slow down. So let's say that at Copy, we've got six thousand feet and above. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to come into the box here and say, look, just to remind me, 
because it won't fly it, but I do want to remember what I'm doing. Rather than 6,000 feet, I'm just going to say 7,500 feet and hope it does it. Really just so that I've got that on screen as a reminder. Okay. Now 5 miles. If I lose 1,000 feet over 5 miles, that's fairly easy mental arithmetic as well. So that would take us up to 8,500 feet by bell hour. So let me put that in there as well. So rather than 6,000 above, we're going to put 8,500 feet in there. And then we've got another, well, let's call it 15 miles. So 9,500 feet, 10,500 feet, 11,500 feet. If we just aim for 11,000 feet at uh, Willisau, that's probably going to be enough for us. I'm going to tune Willisau as well. So let's say it goes uh, 69. 69, and we'll swap over. And then we want the approach itself on the standby, which was 10-1, that's fine, that's already in there. And 10-1 on that side. Great. So, 11,000 feet at Willisau. We're at 29,000 feet at the moment. So what's that? Uh, 18,000 feet to lose. 3 times 18. Uh, is that 54? I'm trying to think. It's a very long day. Yeah, it's about 54, isn't it? Let's just say 60 miles from Willisau will stop the descent from flight level 290. How about that? So, because we've got a DME at Willisau, I'm just going to read it off this gauge here. When it goes down to 60 miles, we'll start the descent down to 11,000 feet. And that way we can fly the whole approach without worrying about how VNAV works or, or whether or not it does anything important. So, we've got this caution here for the fuel. Now, why have we got a caution for the fuel? Well, let me prefix that by saying by my reading of the aircraft documentation, we shouldn't have a caution for the fuel. 146 has got a weird system, okay, a weird fuel system. Here's the main fuel tanks here, the left tank, the right tank and the centre tank. I've got four tonnes of fuel remaining in total. 2,000 on the left, 2,000 on the right. Now, of that four tonnes, I've got these little gauges up here. These are the feed tanks. Okay, and there's about 275 kilograms in each of those feed tanks. Now, these lights are coming on to say the feed tanks are at a lower level, they are not full, basically. Now, let's have a look on the avatar, because I think I've got the diagram on here. There we go. So, this is like a profile, a uh, uh, longitudinal view of the wing. Okay, we're looking at the wing from this perspective here. You've got the main fuel tank, and you've got the engine feed tanks. Okay, these are the pumps here. Now, what you've got on these tanks is like a weir, as you see in a river. There's a weir here, and a weir here. There's like a little slot, if you like, that as the fuel is higher, the fuel's higher than this little slot, it'll spill over into the feed tank. So we can gravity feed into the feed tanks. Okay. When the fuel in the main tank goes below this line one here, you won't be able to get any more fuel into the outer tank. Okay. Uh, sorry, you won't get any more fuel into this orange one here, the inner feed. And when it goes below line two, it's below the weir on the, the outer cell as well. So that is not feeding the inner and not feeding the outer. So if we didn't have any fuel pumps, that's the situation we'd be in at the moment. But We've got these little flapper valves here, and we've got fuel jet pumps to transfer the fuel around the wing, okay? With those jet pumps running, we can drain all of this fuel down here, and it should still pump fuel into the outer tanks, into the feed tanks. So, although it's got this high-level weir, you see it says with just gravity feeding, with just gravity transfer. So at the moment, the aircraft is behaving like it's just transferring using gravity. Okay, I've made the developers aware of that and, and hope they can find some more reference material to work on that. But my understanding is these feed tanks should stay full. If you get this message here and you can't resolve it, then you're into a land ASAP situation. Because look, you've got 250 kilograms of fuel and you're burning 400 kilos an hour. So you need to find a runway to put the aircraft down on. On the fuel system, you've got, this is to do with the centre tank, we're not using that just now. 
crossfeed we're not re really worried about. We've got standby pumps, so these pumps are electric, these pumps are hydraulically driven. We've also got a common feed. Now the common feed fixes this situation here. The common feed allows you to feed um, the number two engine from the number one tank and, and vice versa. So you can, with the 146, you can always get the fuel to the engines in theory, as long as you've got pumps. Without pumps, you can't gravity feed all the fuel. So you have to sort it out a little bit. So hopefully that'll get sorted out. But it's an interesting system. It's one of these fun things about the, the 146, the, the fuel system. They've even got... Um, let me just bring up the volume because it's a little bit noisy outside. They've even got pannier fuel tanks. There's fuel tanks in, in this section here and this section here. And when they were converted into executive aircraft into fancy business jets. They could have extra fuel tanks in the cargo hold as well. If you weren't using the cargo hold, they would uh, fit extra fuel tanks in there for you. Just get a bit more range out of it. So although we've got this fuel warning message here, we'll, we'll not worry about it. We'll just carry on and things will be fine. Don't do that in real life. And a couple of new followers there as well. Um, from during the week, we've got uh, uh, Sammy. I don't know if you're on the stream the, this evening, Sammy, but thanks for the follow, regardless. Uh, we've got uh, Lindesis, is it? Lindesis? And uh, Melvin Reli, thanks for the follow. Much appreciated. Macrit, this is the Just Flight uh, 146. Um, Just Flight and Thranda have, uh, have developed this 146. It was released this week, yeah. There's another 146, there's an Avro Liner 146, but it's very difficult to find any uh, information on that. How are we getting on? So the fixed page, of all the things this FMS does, having the fixed page is probably the most useful thing, because it, it shows us how far we've got to go, really. 29 minutes. Now, the other thing to look at here is... The airport's down here somewhere. We are flying across on this approach here. Where is it? So, we're coming from over here. We're flying across here, into there, and down and turning in. If we were to get a shortcut from, say, here to here, that'd be quite difficult in any other aircraft. But the 146 has got that massive speed brake, so we could probably sort it out. If I was flying this route in real life and it was obvious, you know, after my first trip I'd be fairly conservative, I'd plan for the shortcut. And if I got the shortcut 50% of the time, I would always plan to be in a position such that I could accept the shortcut without any drama. If it was a once every 10 times you get the shortcut, you just wouldn't plan for it, uh, because it just wouldn't be worth the fuel burn of being at a lower level for longer. And if you do get the shortcut, you use the speed breaker, you just accept the fact you don't get the shortcut and, and live with it. There's a few airfields like that. There's some places you always have to plan for the, the the shortest possible track. Other places you just expect to fly the full track all the time. Oh, Sammy. Yeah, I wondered if that was the if you're the same person. How are you liking the the 747-200? I'm excited for for everybody to see the 747. I think it's going to be good fun. X-Plane default textures, to be honest, not doing too bad a job with this part of France. I think we're in the Champagne region, I think they call it. It kind of looks a little bit like this. Not quite as bland. It's nice that um, a couple of years ago in X-Plane, it was very general aviation heavy, um, whereas uh, these days, um, we've got some long-haul aircraft to look forward to. Pilsner asks, on a longer flight, are you going to run out of fuel in the feed tanks and then the engines flame out? No, you shouldn't do. Um, so the way I understand it is they've interpreted this to mean that... Uh, imagine the way that it's been implemented is if these baffles, if these plates here were simply baffles with holes drilled in them, it can still feed 
fuel. Fuel can still basically drain down in here. Um, I, I don't think I've got a better diagram. Right, so you've got... How can I explain this? Ignore the bottom part of these fuel tanks to begin with, right? Totally ignore this. And what you've got here is two little waterfalls, two little fuel falls. So the fuel here is pouring over into this tank, the orange tank, and it's then pouring over the little gap into the pink tank here. Okay, and that's gravity feed. It also has these flapper valves down here on the orange cell only. So as the fuel drops down, as it goes below this weir level here, it'll still drain into the orange cell here because it's got a flapper valve, okay? So that equalizes the pressure, allows fuel to flow outboard, but doesn't allow fuel to flow inboard, okay? So with no other source of motive propulsion for the fuel, the orange tank and the blue tank will have the same level, okay, because of this flapper valve. The pink tank, once the fuel gets below line two, nothing can get into the pink tank, so it will run out of fuel when it's gravity feeding. You get round that problem, excuse me, so you get round that problem with, uh, I should have looked at the manual because I knew I'd get questions on this. It's the common feed as I understand it. Let's open the common feed. Does it do anything? No. So the common feed should supply both of these so this is feeding engine number one, this is feeding engine number two, and there's the opposite on the opposite side. But with the common feed open, it's like a cross feed between these two tanks. So both of the engines, one and two, can feed from both of those tanks. Okay. So you'll have your final reserve, if you like, will be in this tank here. Does that make sense? That's it, gravity feeding. When these pumps are on, when the main pumps are on, it's got jet pumps. Um, if you've watched any of Totorico's streams, you'll, you'll hear about jet pumps in the fuel. And that is simply using fuel transfer as a method of pushing more fuel. So it uses jet pumps to transfer our fuel from here to here and here. So all the pumps running, all the engines running, it'll maintain the two outer tanks, the two feed tanks at full level, as long as there's any fuel in here. So this will drain all the way down to the standpipes and these will still be full. That's how it happens in the real aircraft. This at the moment is simply behaving as if it's gravity feeding. So you can see that the inners are down a little bit more than the outers. That's because the outers at this level and the inners at this level. Kind of hope that makes sense. And I, I've sent the feedback to them. I'm kind of hoping that uh, they'll consult their subject matter expert and, uh, and take it from there. So in the add-on right now, both the feed tanks will be at the same, at the two level. Uh, kinda. So it looks, from the way they've coded it, as if these are, just imagine a single level drawn across the whole of the tanks and forget that these exist other than as a, as a baffle, if you like. So it's basically indicating the percentage top to bottom here, percentage top to bottom here, and percentage top to bottom here. That's the that's where you're getting on the on the overheads here. So see this one's closer to full because it's up here, but they will, as it's implemented, they'll drain down in a single line. Hope that makes sense. It probably doesn't, it's probably nonsense. Superboy, a bit on the fence about the 742. It's difficult, um, it's difficult. If you've got Felicis, um 154, I would say the 747-200 is a lot better than the 154. Um, it's a lot more accessible um, because the systems are what you might be familiar with. It's got the flight engineer's panel, which is fairly detailed. And what, you know, Felis is working with, um, with another a very experienced 747 flight engineer who understands the systems inside out. Uh, so Felix has got his own subject matter expert, if you like, making sure that the, the sim behaves like the real thing does. And from a flying perspective, um, 
one old Boeing is about the same as another old Boeing. You know, if you fly the 737-200 or the 727 uh, models, they have the same kind of feel to them, the same kind of interactions with the aircraft. Although the 747 is at a heavy weight, it's a lot more interesting. It, it really, you need to get the numbers spot on. You need to fly it precisely at maximum weight, otherwise you have trouble with it. But the systems panel, um, the subject matter expert that's working with Phyllis says the systems panel is so it would have been suitable as a procedures trainer back in the day. So you could you could basically become familiar with the real operation of the aircraft using the systems panel. And, uh, you know, I, I can believe that. We are 144 miles from the uh, will, I think. We can double check that. Again, I'll use this one. Uh, fix. Put in will. I should really be identing the nav aids, but I never have any luck with explaining identing nav aids. 142, 142, yeah, it's all good. So just a reminder, we said we're going to descend to uh, 11,000 feet, uh, about 60 miles out from Will. So the, the fuel system on the 146 is fascinating, Pilgrimage. Um As I said, it, it does come with documentation. Uh, I'll show you that, because uh, it's in here. Uh, let me work out how to do this. There we go. Here's the manual. So you've got, excuse me, you've got a fairly extensive manual, right? You've got the systems overview, auto flight system. Just Flight have documented this to appeal to a fairly wide range of simmers. Um, you can get some complicated add-ons that assume an element of um, of knowledge about aircraft. The Just Flight stuff, it, it is very accessible. There's a there's a full I'm trying to find it now. It's probably 200 pages away. So basically, 168 to 196. So you've got what um, just about 30 pages, 28 pages of how to fly the aircraft, and there's lots of pictures in there as well. If you fly it according to this, you'll have fun with it. Um, it's the sort of aircraft that, uh, without being without being critical of it, it's a sort of aircraft that if you look at the FCOM and you try and fly it precisely to the FCOM, um, you'll end up getting frustrated. Um, because not all sim aircraft are really built with that in mind. But I have to be honest, I, I enjoy flying it. I didn't enjoy testing it. Um, I, I found testing this aircraft to be quite frustrating. Um, but I enjoy flying it now. It's good fun to fly. Yes, the INS, uh, a 747-200 is going to live and die on the quality of the INS, uh, Pilsnerage. Felix is getting there. It's certainly, the, the INS is way better than the, than the, uh, the Philip uh, INS. If you've seen the Kolomata Concorde, which has got its own INS and also uses the Philip uh, INS, uh, the 747 is leagues ahead of that. And there's some things that's not quite right yet, but I, I'm fairly confident Felix will get there. It, it's a different league compared to the Concorde. Yeah, he's doing his own INS, Jack Josh Junkie. It's the uh, Delco Carousel he's doing. So the same system as uh, Philips implemented. Big difference is you've got all three of them. Uh, you've got three INSs and they work separately, um, which adds a little bit of interest. It's able to do DME updating. It's able to do triple mixing. It's able to do present position updating. Um, Philips INS, it doesn't drift at all. If you do DME updating on it, you're largely doing it for the sake of clicking buttons because there's no need to do it. But um, with Felix's model, you do need to update it. That trim wasn't doing that on the previous version, so I need to look into why it's doing that just now. So, 60 miles until we descent. Fly by. It's 
got descent mode on the um, on the uh, TMS as well. That regulates the engines to maintain a minimum of 60% N2 for the pressurization and the anti-ice to still work. So with uh, older aircraft, not so much these days, but with older aircraft, there was a minimum power setting for the descent. Otherwise, there wasn't enough bleed power, bleed air from the engines to, to do what you wanted them to do. On the descent on this aircraft, we need to put the APU back on. We need to transfer the air supply back over to the APU air. And uh, we need to put the PTU on as well. So we're going to start the APU normally at flight level 100, but it's kind of busy this approach. So we'll start it just below flight level 150 and the PTU will put back on again as well. And again, that PTU is just to balance the hydraulic load. So we've only got these two hydraulic pumps. The PTU makes sure that something that's using a lot of power from uh, the green system can be augmented, if you like, by power from the yellow system. So each hydraulic system has got two sources of power. Um, on the yellow system, you've got the engine and the AC pump and the DC pump, but let's not count that. And on the green system, you've got the PTU and the engine driven pump. And if this pump fails, the engine three pump fails, the AC pump will switch on. Uh, so even though the yellow system maintains pressure, because the green system has lost its supply, it knows you're going to turn the PTU on. So it already runs the AC pump, so you've got double the power going into the yellow system so that it can feed the green system as well. And the, the model does seem to do most of that. Any other questions you've got on the on the 146 before we start the descent? Because it gets kind of busy when we go downhill here. It's so slow. It really is. It's it's. Well, I mean, we are doing. Let's be honest. You know, that's 400 knots, right? That is about 450 miles an hour. But it just seems slow. You know, 0 0.67 mark. That's that's not fast. Tail West, thanks very much for the follow. Much appreciated. Hope you're having a... If you're still listening to the chat, hope you're having a super time. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, the 145 can't have the bleeds on APU and icing. Yeah, so um, the... The, if, I, if I put the engine anti-ice on, it doesn't... I don't know how it does it, to be quite honest. I think it's a separate valve it has, in the same way as the Challenger is a separate valve. But you can run the engine anti-ice um, while you're running the... You see anti-ice and engine air. You can have one without the other, I think. I've not been able to find a full FCOM for the, for the aircraft, so... It's basically going along with what you can um, what you can find online. It depends on the temperature and the um, the elevation, Superboy. Um, London City is around about what fourteen hundred meters, fifteen hundred. I think it would struggle at maximum takeoff way out of there, but really for a two-hour sector, one and a half two-hour sector, you'd have no problems out at fifteen hundred meters at sea level. As I said, the good thing about the 146 is you um, you don't lose a, as much climb performance uh, as you would in a twin if you lose one engine. So that's why it can operate at London City where there's a, a fair number of close-in obstacles. So the fairly common rule, Macra, is if the aircraft is built in the UK, how does the manufacturer tackle X? And the answer is Y and the most complicated method possible into the bargain. British aircraft like to be weird, right? So like the 747, we're talking about the 747-200. It's got four engines, right? The same as this, it's got four engines. How did Boeing get the resilience on the 747? Well, they fitted four generators, generator one, generator two, generator three, generator four. 
How did they get redundancy on the hydraulics? Well, they fitted four hydraulic systems. Hydraulic system one, system two, system three, system four. But what about resilience on those systems? Well, they fitted air-driven pumps or air demand pumps. So pumps number five, six, seven, and eight. And what about for taxing on the ground? Well, electric pump here and sometimes electric pump there. So they just made it easy by fitting lots of hardware to it. Obviously, the 146 was developed for these kind of short takeoff, steep climb things. So minimizing structural weight is an important thing, right? There's actually a CBT online. If you search for 146 hydraulic CBT, um, it's an hour long. It's quite boring, but it goes into the system in, in a fair bit of detail. It's, it's complicated. Leading Edge Simulations, thanks for joining the chat. Yeah, we're still live, just about. Vinny, hello again, yeah. It's, uh, how is the Jumbolina? I don't know, you tell me, what do you think about it? I enjoy flying it. Um, as I said at the outset, I, I do enjoy flying it. Um, I've not been pulling it threads on it. The panel texturing annoys me. Um, it's not to my taste, and as I was saying at the at the beginning, if you, if you missed that, it's not the fact I don't like dirty panels. It's the fact the outside of the aircraft is brand new. You know, there's there's no dirt on this airframe whatsoever. There's no suit on the pylons. It's all a new aircraft, and then you come in here and it's you know 35, 40 years old. That's um, that's the thing. That's the thing that I don't like about it. The, the panel texturing gets on my nerves. Is it Graham or is it Jim Browning? Do you know Jim Browning's from Northern Ireland and I'm from Scotland? Um, but I do get that quite a bit, um, going out. I think it's because my wife's from Northern Ireland. I think I pick up some of the accent from there. Descending in 10 miles. We probably do a similar sort of, um, what we'd call a telephone voice as well. Because if I was to speak at my natural pace and diction, it would be almost intellig unintelligible. And it's probably the same for Jim, growing up in Northern Ireland. So I think we try and pronunciate a little bit clearer when we're on the computer. Thanks, Airfighter. Uh, have a good rest. It must be fairly late there. Have a good one. Right, I'm going to dial the cabin altitude down to landing altitude because it's all manual on this. So let's go down to 1,600 feet. Cabin is descending. I'm going to just wind it down. I'm going to wind it all the way down to 6,000. Which is the uh, the first minimum altitude there. The R's. Nor an iron, as they say. Right, 60 miles. So rather than using the sync button uh, on the control yoke, because I don't have that bound, I'm just going to do it the, the easy way. Look, I'm going to put it into IES hold mode here. I've changed the vertical mode, so I'm going to make sure I arm altitude. This will catch Airbus pilots out left, right and centre. I don't understand why it doesn't do it. Anyway, IES hold, and then I'm going to bring the power back, and I'm going to put it into descent mode for the TMS. That just makes sure I maintain a minimum power setting. And as I bring the power off, see the aircraft goes into the descent. So it's now going to comfortably maintain 250 knots, and I've got control of the rate of descent with the power. Okay, And I don't have to worry about... Not so much. I don't have to worry about keeping an eye on the speed. I've just got control of the rate of descent. I can also do it in Mach as well. The difference is, if I do it in Mach, it'll accelerate and then come back to 250. I'll need to come back to 250. I just do it in IES now. It's simply going to maintain 250 knots all the way down. Yeah, I, 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 I don't mind a little bit of wear and tear um, on the panels. Uh, stuff like this, I can kind of understand that. This just mucky texture. I don't. I don't like that. It's a taste thing, I think. That's all right. Uh, uh, leading edge simulations. It's the. I use auto mod on here because sometimes I'm not paying attention to chat quite as often as I should do, and it didn't like the term uh, "filthy pretty" in the same sentence. It, it's not very smart. The auto mod thing.
it didn't pick up the individual words it, it kind of saw pretty filthy and the same thing and uh, you can use your imagination for the rest of it it didn't like the word knobs last week we're talking about uh, some knobs on the aircraft it didn't think that was very appropriate and uh, turbine intertemperature didn't like that as well right going downhill make sure the cabin is descending i've got descent modes we can update the speeds all right so these are the vref speeds i'll click on that and it'll set the speeds i'm going to do flaps 33 I'm going to set 119, it's 114 plus 5, so I'm just going to set that on here. There we go. For flap speeds on the aircraft, you could do it, you could slow down all the way to the VRF speed plus a few knots and then, you know, down to 175 say and then take flaps 18 and then down to 140. It's going to get confusing, right? So all I do, little placards here, you got 210, 170, 160, 140. I'll slow down to 190 knots clean. I'll set flaps 18. Then I'll slow down to a minimum of 150 knots. Then I'll select flaps 24. And I've got a minimum of 130 knots. So 90, 50, 30, everything else. Uh, and that's all you need to remember. And that'll work at pretty much every weight. And there we go. How are we doing on the descent planning? Have I screwed it up by talking too much? That's usually the thing. I want it to be at 11,000 feet at, um, I've forgotten the name of it, Willisau. That's 13,000 uh, feet to lose. It's 13, 26, 39. Yeah, I've got 39 miles. That's kind of working. So no auto thrust, no VNAV, simply an IAS pitch hold mode and regulating the rate of descent with the power lever. The placard. Yeah, so some normal landing flaps are 24 and 33 uh, on the left. This one. Oh, this one. I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah, it's... It's a bit rough, isn't it? I think it's metal. I think it's like etched metal as well. So just coming up to uh, 10,000 feet to lose towards Willisau, that would be 30 miles. Yeah, it's more or less there. I think in this case, I mean, what's obvious is that Just Flight are, Just Flight are bringing models that were previously developed or have been developed for Prepared 3D and FSX into, into X-Plane. Um, and they're doing that in partnership with, with Thranda. Thranda are doing the systems for them. Uh, just like Thranda used to do the same for Coronado. Um, whether or not the, the state of the modelling in here... Um, I, as I said, I, I, I do think it could be better in here. I'll be honest, it, it, it could be better by the standard of the day. Um, whether or not that's a function of being designed for initially for FSX, which is probably a bigger market for them, I, I really don't know. If you want to fly a 146, you can look past that. You know. yes. I like the outside a little bit better. I think the it feels like the outside's been done by a different modeler. Um, it looks fairly sharp on the outside. Um, uh, there's a few little things, but it, it looks like the shape of a 146. Um, I, I don't have that sort of eye to to pick out different modeling touches on it. What I like about the the outside is the materials. Um, it doesn't have that super shiny look that some X-Plane aircraft have. The, the metal textures aren't overdone like some X-Plane aircraft have. So it's, uh, it's not too bad. 
I'm quite happy to have a 146 uh, in this sim. If they do an RJ version of it, uh, even better, because the RJ is a lot more accessible for um, FMS kind of pilots. Do you know what? I'm going to just pop this up here, and then I'm going to scroll that down, because really, I put these altitudes in here just to remind myself more than anything else, so I may as well have them displayed. So we've got 7,000 feet to lose, 7, 14, 21, like 21 miles. So the ground speed's displayed here. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number, I'm going to divide it in two, so that's what, 15, 16, let's call it 17. Uh, 170 officially, but look, hide that last digit, divide that into 17, 1700 feet a minute. That's how you fly a three degree glide slope. You don't need to worry about times. You don't need to worry about, oh, you know, I'm doing um, five and a half miles a minute and, and so on and so forth. Look, take that number there, knock the last digit off, half it, and then fly that VS. It, it's basically how you do it. And if you're in IES pitch mode, you don't need to worry about anything else. Now, we've got those lovely spoilers, uh, speed brake, air brake on the back of the aircraft, and that'll cause quite a rate of pitch down. Um, it will cause the aircraft to get slow. Okay, it's trying to maintain 250 knots. If I whack that air brake all the way out, it will lose about 10 knots. And then what it's going to do is it's going to put the nose down but it'll put the nose all the way down to try and capture 250 again. So you've just got to be a little bit careful of that. Thanks, Sammy. Um, thanks for joining the stream. And uh, hopefully we'll get to do one of these on the 747-200 in not too distant future as well. Eh? You have a good one. Yeah, leading edge simulations, that's, um, that's one of the easiest ways to do it, and it works for pretty much all aircraft. Um, you just do... 3,000 feet, uh, 3 miles per thousand feet, or it doesn't quite work the maths if you do it either way, there's subtle differences, but just take the altitude to go. So I'm going into 11,000 feet, I'm at 15,000 feet, that's 4,000 feet to lose, that means I need 12 miles, and I've got 12 miles. And you fly that profile by doing half your ground speed on the VSI, it's pretty much, that's it in a nutshell. Right, 15,000 feet. I'm going to put that PTO on, because otherwise I forget. It's going to bing, despite the fact there's nothing new there. I, I'm going to put the logo lights on because, you know, fly the flag. I'm going to start the APU. I'm going to put the fast and seatbelt signs on. It binged at me again. Yeah, th this is one of my reasons for getting interested in the 146 Superboy. Is I, I love the VC-10 as well, and with that in the works, I wanted to uh, see if there was anything I could do to to help the... Uh, not to help, that sounds very... It's not the word I'm looking for. If there was anything I could do to make sure that the experience with um, P3D aircraft being brought over to X-Plane for just flight was as good as they could be, if that makes sense. That's not. Um, it may come across as sounding conceited. That's not what I'm aiming for. I, I just wanted to make sure that Just Flight were aware of what X Plane could do, if you like. So we've got the APU on. I've got the generator on, and I've got the uh, number four bleed air is on to still run the pressurization system. Otherwise, the air bleeds are off, and we've got APU air on as well. That should cover us, and it's flashing some other warning as well. I'm going to put the uh, FO side onto nav mode just now, check 138 and 110.1, one. that's fine. And as we're crossing over Willisau, I'll change over onto the approach. And here we are, so it's turning the corner. So from here, I'm looking for Belar, 8,500 feet. Now that's three times uh, rule of thumb. There's another rule of thumb we can use, and that's one third of the ground speed. So if I put this into vertical speed mode now, and I'm doing... Actually, I'm still a little bit on the high side, so let me just get some more height off there, because it's cutting the corner. If I want to do 5 miles per thousand feet, rather than 3 miles per thousand feet, to do 5 miles per thousand feet, all I do is one third of the ground speed. So 300 knots, 1,000 feet a minute. And it's, it's the same, just a different rule of thumb. But I need to keep coming down. I want to be eight and a half thousand feet in 12 miles. 
So I've got 3,000 feet to go. So yeah, it's just about working out. I'll just back the speed off ever so slightly, back the vertical speed off ever so slightly. I'll bring the power off and start slowing the aircraft down. And let's have the landing lights on. Conway engine sounds, you've got to get the Conway sounds right. The problem is there's not many of them there since the um, VC-10 was retired. You've got to get them off video now, I think. I don't think there's anything running with Conways. You could maybe get the um, the Victor K2, they do an engine run on the Victor K2. I don't know if there's a VC-10 with engines running. So 2,000 feet to lose, we've got 8 miles. So somewhere between 2 and 3 degree profile, that's what we're doing. And just to check on the chart, above 6,000, above 6,000, above 4,000. So once we sequence to Lardo, I'm going to set 4,000 in the window. We've got a DME from the ILS showing as well. What I need to do is to set that course indicator. So it was uh, 208. If I turn that on to 208, because we have to transition from RNAV mode to um, lock mode. Sounds complicated. It should make sense. So Bell R. We've got a thousand feet to go until the Bellar target altitude, about four miles. So yeah, all I'm going to do is just going to knock the vertical speed back to about a thousand feet a minute. And now I'm commanding the vertical speed with the, excuse me, with the key binding. So I've got key bindings for the pitch control wheel down there. And uh, controlling the speed with the, with the thrust levers. So I said that the the shallow descent was between uh, Willisau and Copy, and then we need to go back to a three degree descent at Copy. There we go, Copy. We can go down to seven and a half thousand feet, or seven and a half thousand feet is the target altitude. Six thousand feet is the cleared level. So six thousand feet's in there. Oh, if there's a fast taxi VC-10, then that might uh, might do the job. It's an awesome sounding machine, and it looks beautiful as well. So I think I can probably start to slack off that vertical speed ever so slightly. Oh, it's still 6,000 feet is fine, but 7.5 is the nominal profile that I calculated, and the speed's coming back to 190 knots now, which is where roughly I want to maintain it. So after copy, we're going to descend down towards Lardo, and I want to be back at 210 knots. Well, I'm already back at 190 for Lardo, above 4000. Of course, this is still looking at the RNAV, and this is looking at the, at the ILS. Annoyingly, X-Plane doesn't do it right until you turn inbound, but uh, just come into life now. Now we get Lardo as the two-way point. We'll go down to 4000 feet. Double check here, yeah. Lardo, 4,000 feet. I'll take that first stage of flaps. And we'll let it come back to about 150 knots. More British airliners from the 1960s pilgrimage, that's the spirit. That's what we want. That trim's annoying, isn't it? Right, so back to my uh, three degree profile, that's about 900 to 1000 feet a minute now. Turning in. It's a difficult aircraft to find information on, leading edge simulations for sure. So as we turn in, hey look at that, the glide slope came to life and I'm roughly on profile. That'll do. 
I'll take that. Water injection. Oh yes. There's a spay engines, weren't they? Oh, a 510 would be awesome. A 200 would be great. But the 475 is the beast. The 475, 111. That's got the big engines and the small fuselage. That's what you want. 150 knots is the minimum I said I'd take with uh, this config. I'm going to take uh, gear down. Flaps 24. And now it's turning inbound. As we turn, it should survive. Let's do it. There's the switch. It's gone into Vorlock mode. We'll arm glide slope. And I'll just back the vertical speed off. And we'll pick up the glide slope from underneath. So I said a minimum of 130 with flaps 24. Yeah, it does all that. Um, it hasn't quite captured. Are we in for a lot? Let's try heading, just to persuade it to do that a little bit better. Yeah, it kind of said it done something, it didn't actually do it, so I'm just going to fix that. No dramas. That's why you monitor what it's doing. It did save for lock, but then it didn't actually capture, so hey-ho. All is good. What was that? It, it said both things simultaneously. There was Light one. slope captured. There we go. Just going to give it a touch of the air brake now. Go for half air brake. I'll get rid of this. And... Flaps 30. Flaps 33. It does seem slightly off, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not done a great job of that capture. I've tried this once or twice before and it seemed alright. Let's just fix it. So we're on speed, we've got gear down, three greens, we've got half brake, which is what we wanted. Uh, we've got the belts on, the lights, and uh, everything else that matters is set. Right, let's fix this. Autopilot's coming out. I'll leave the flight directors on just to see what happens. I don't think it ever fully captured properly, if I'm being honest. It's only slightly off. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened there. I've never seen it do that before, so... The it's miracles of the live audience. television. There she's. I mean, the flight directors are providing appropriate guidance. I think it's just got a fairly narrow torture tolerance. So normally what I do there is I try to do a nav to nav transfer. I try to go from uh, uh, lateral nav into Vorlock and it kind of did something, but I think it actually failed into roll mode and didn't enunciate it. So I should have gone to heading mode and just steered it on. If I'd done heading mode on this leg here, that would have solved the problem. But no dramas. There's Burn. So look at my descent rate. I'm doing 120 knots. That should be 600 feet a minute on a 3 degree profile. I'm doing closer to 800. Maybe 1000. Now with all of those callouts it gives you, it doesn't give you a Radout 5040 callout. I tried setting it on the Radout mins, but that didn't seem to do what I wanted. So we just have to do the best we can. And uh, sometimes the landing isn't pretty. But it's got that trailing link gear, so we just deal with it. X Europe? Uh, yes, I do, Jet Jazz Junkie. That's, uh, that's what you're seeing down here. I think it looks really nice. I'm a touch fast looking at the chat there. His power's coming off. Get half break. I'll just give it a squidge more. A squidge being a very technical term for a precise application of power. Back on speed. Now 
And this is the kind of airport the 146 was, was built for, you know. This is a lot closer to the city uh, than uh, any of the other airports, like Baal or Zurich. There's a centre line somewhere here, Graham. There we go. Ease the power. Look at the far end. Full flap, uh, full brake. Then she goes. Brakes. No reverse, so I'll just push the brakes. 80 knots. There's Charlie. 60 knots. Yeah, that's right, Pilsner. So what I've got is I do the approach. For a steep approach, I have them about here. Okay, and then the button that I normally have on reversers, I've got for full brakes. Now, let me just come to a halt and we'll have a look at that because people will get confused by this. So I just hold it on the brakes. Come on, aircraft, you can stop. There we go. So look, on the ground, all right? Is it going to do it this time? There we go. So because the it doesn't have automatic um, lift dumpers, okay, these things here, they don't, they're not fitted to the 146, only to the RJ. So I've got control of the, as you so eloquently put it, the butt flaps. I've got control of the butt flaps when the um, air brake goes to the fully extended position you get the spoilers as well. So I've got two buttons. I've actually got three buttons. There's spoilers closed. There's the first extension which gives me full air brake and the next extension which gives me the uh, ground lift dumpers. If I have it on this position here and then I use the full extension button it goes all the way there. So in the 146, on a steep approach, around about here for the approach, power to idle, just before you contact, go from maximum reverse. Let's have a look at that in the replay while we're here. It's probably a touch on the firm side, but you know, short runway. Oh, look at all that messing around I was doing. Come on, little airplane. I don't want to drag it. When I drag it, it goes badly wrong. What I want to do though, Right along. Gratuitous. Here we go. So, if you've seen the 146 uh, Swiss video at London City, it's got fairly strong gear, this aircraft. And you don't want to be floating on a long runway. On a short runway. So, I'll put it down. Ah, oh, look at that. That's where you want the nose gear to be. I'm fairly happy with that. Right, don't let's stop sink. messing around. Don't sink. Don't uh, sink. Don't sink. I wasn't planning to. Don't sink. Right. Don't sink. Finish with that. Right, let's get this thing parked. I forgot where we rolled out. Delta. There's only one taxiway that you can actually get a 146 on here, and that's Charlie. So we'll do a turn on the runway. Uh, I'll finish messing around. I'll put the air brakes up. Or track the flaps. Thanks, Macrit. Thanks for joining the stream. Glad you enjoyed it, and uh, you have a good one. Let's just turn on the runway because I'm lazy. There's a turning circle at the end, but you can easily turn the 146 here. And this is this is exactly the job the 146 was built for. Uh, Dan Air operated out of Gatwick because in 1983 there there wasn't a London City Airport. Um, what this city centre to city centre is what it's done for. Taxing in, let's have the probe heats off. Um, we'll leave the hydraulics for now. Strobes and beacon because we're on the runway. Uh, well, strobes are on the runway, but I'll put the lights off all together. Yeah, we'll just park it and then we'll shut it down anyway. Um, but just so you've seen the shutdown as well. Prop Duster, thanks for the follow. Hope you've been enjoying the stream. I thought for a second I'd turn on to the wrong taxiway there, but no, all is good. Right. This is like a taxi on and turn kind of situation. 
I do wish those ground vehicles were not positioned quite as close to the aircraft as what uh, people have them. So I'm just going to... It's kind of difficult in the sim to judge where the heck you are. I don't know, I'm going to say there. Right there. Ah, uh, let's go forward a little bit. This is why we have marshlers. Um, at low power settings, Superboy, the, um, my understanding is the engines don't have the, uh, the bleed capacity to operate everything at the same time, so use the APU. And it also gives you a little bit more temperature margin if you have a missed approach. So brakes are set, the parking brakes there, so let's switch off the PTU, let's switch off the AC pump, verify the engine pumps are still providing pressure. They are, we'll turn those off. APU generator's on, it's already, it should all be running on the system. So I'll have the galley off, gens off, and uh, all of those are switched off. Right, let's shut it down. I'm going to do, you know what, I was messing around, the radar should have gone off, my bad. Let's, um, where's the click spot? Come on, Mr. Click Spot, oh, you know, it's my joystick. If you can't get the engines off, there we go. If you can't get the switches, it's because your throttle hasn't quite got to idle. It doesn't seem to like that if you're not at replay. If, you, if, you, if you've done a replay, it doesn't seem to behave itself. 2000 for conspicuity and standby. Right, so double check the engines are going off by looking at the fuel flows. The fuel flows are all zero. We'll work on the base. The cabin crew have disarmed the slides. What is that? Some other bing. That's fine. Right, beacon off. Um, beacon off. Transponder off. Fuel pumps off. And what else have we got to do? I think we've done it all. Just quick. Strobes. It was the strobes. I knew there'd be something. Um, cool. That's us. That's the Just Flight 146. Let's open the passenger doors. Let's open the stairs, put the GP on. No, there we go. So the animation's a little bit better than the than the first uh, release of it. And we've got external power, so let's put the external power to on. Let's have the research, the packs, the APU air, the APU gen. Off, off, off. Nav lights off. Logo lights off. Cabin emergency lights disarm. Flight deck emergency lights off. Uh, sorry, fasten seat belts off would have been the first one. And uh, flight deck lights off. Ready to shut it down. That's it, folks. That's the Just Flight uh, 146. As I said, you've got the three versions of the aircraft, or the three major versions, plus the sub-versions of the Quiet Trader and the the military transport um, statesman is the name I was looking for, the CC2, CC Mark II statesman, I think it's called. Um, and they've got lots of different liveries in there as well. It's about four and a half gigabytes of download. If you do have any questions about the uh, aircraft, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, it's usually easiest to get in touch with me on Discord, on the Hot Start Discord, uh, otherwise on the YouTube channel or however you prefer. Thanks for joining me on the stream this evening. Um, I hope you have a, a pleasant day. If it's just coming into Sunday for you, have a super day. And uh, I do hope you'll tune in again. Maybe not having a stream uh, next week. In fact, I won't be having a stream next week. Uh, I've got some recurrent sims to do for work. And I've got vaccination next week uh, after the Sims. So that's all happening. Uh, it'll probably be a couple of weeks until we're able to do a Sim again. Thanks, folks. And uh, have a good weekend.